um, it's wonderful to see you here. Thank you so much for coming and supporting our book talks this week. Um, my name is June Casey, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Harvard Law School Library to our talk today to celebrate Jillian Thomas and her new book, Because of Sex, a One Law, Ten Cases, and Fifty Years that Changed American Lives at Work. We're so fortunate to have Jillian here. She is a senior staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union Women's Rights Project. She previously litigated sex discrimination cases at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and Legal Momentum, which is formerly now Legal Defense and Education Fund. Um, Jillian is joined by Judge Nancy Gertner, who is our now senior, se senior lecturer on law, and she is former United States Federal Judge for the United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts. She is also the author of a book published in 2012 titled In Defense of Women, Memoirs, memoirs of an Unrepentant Advocate. So she is actually a very good commentator for this book today. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to remind you of two things. Um, the, the book talk is going to be recorded and it's going to be released on the Law School's YouTube channel in about a week. So you can tell your friends who couldn't be here today that they can actually um, watch the video later. Um, because of the recording on YouTube, I also need to tell you that at the end of the talk when we have our question and answer period, that any questions that you've asked and the answers will be recorded. The last thing I'm going to say before I turn the talk over to our panelists is that we are very fortunate to have the Harvard Law School Coop here in the back of the room um, with copies of the book that for you to um, purchase today. And we actually will have Jillian here after the talk for signing of the books. So without any further remarks, I'll turn the panel to you. Thank you. Uh, I want to start with a very uh, simple question. Uh, when I tell stories about how I started as a lawyer and uh, overt discrimination that I encountered and the cases that I took, I always wind up with someone in the audience who uh, asks the question of why do these stories matter? Why does it matter? Why do we need to constantly roll back the clock to then and talk about what went on in the 70s and the 60s? Why does these discussions matter? And that's a version of why did you write the book? Why don't we put it in the middle? Um, first of all, thank you so much to um, June and the library for having me here today in the law school, um, and of course to Judge Gertner for joining me. It's a huge honor um, to be here, and I'm frankly uh, pleasantly surprised to see so many people here. I know it was a hard day probably to make decisions about where to go on campus. Um, just wanted to let you know, regardless of your feeling about the, the strike, I'm um, picking up some lunch for strikers afterwards if you feel like joining me, um, uh, and however you feel about um, the strike, if you are a supporter, there are lots of ways to support, including contributing to the strike fund. Um, so thank you for hearing my uh, my Pinko Kami message. And finally, if you know anybody who felt um, uncomfortable coming today or uh, just wasn't able to make it, I am going to be at Porter Square Books this evening as well at 7 o'clock um, doing, a, doing a reading there and a talk as well. Um, so back to the question of why I wrote the book, a couple of reasons. Um, first, I am an employment lawyer. And so cases like these, all of the cases that are in this book, there are 10 of them. Um, are, are sort of like brand names. They're cases I use all the time. And at a certain point of about seven or eight years ago, I realized that I used them like brand names, throwing them off. Um, when, when a client would come in my office and talk about sexual harassment, I'd talk about, oh, Meritor is per severe or pervasive, um, or Phillips v. Martin Marietta, sex plus, motherhood bias. And I um, started to get interested in actually who these women were. And at, at the time, I was working with, with on a project at Now Legal Defense that um, concerned women who were in male-dominated jobs, so female firefighters, police officers, construction workers. I made it might as well be 1964 for these women in terms of the harassment and discrimination they face, the overt discrimination. We have our girl on People the job already. Fox News. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just to, yeah. Just to sort of bring it up to just, date. Yeah, if, right. Um, and... Uh, and so I, I was so struck by their their um, persistence and their um, sort of moxie, really, um, every day on the job. And I thought, these women who were making these cases in this book had none of the precedent. They didn't have the brand names to rely on. They were making the brand names up. Um, they were the brand names. And so I wanted to figure out who those women 
were. I wanted to know them um, while they were still with us. I didn't want that history to die. And um, and I'll tell a very brief story, if I could, just uh, about the, the one firsthand story I did learn at the very, very beginning that, that convinced me I had to write the book, which was, um, you know, to get an agent and a book deal, I needed a sample chapter. And a sample chapter required me to interview somebody, because I was um, telling first-person accounts. And I managed to meet with um, Teresa Harris, now Teresa Wilson, of the Harris v. Forklift mm -hmm. chapter, which is the, the second sexual harassment case in the book. And I flew down to Nashville and met on a Saturday with her and her lawyer, Erwin Venick. It was so generous of them. They didn't know me. And um, at one point, uh, Teresa told a story about, about two weeks before the trial, um, her harasser, Charles Hardy, who was the president of the company where she worked and had called her a dumbass woman and would jingle change in his pocket and ask her to retrieve a quarter um, and so on. Uh, about two weeks before the trial, she no longer worked there, he asked her to have a drink with him. And she was a little nervous about it, but she brought along a friend. At this point in the interview, by the way, Erwin Venick says, you what? He had no idea that she had ever done this. I mean, two weeks before the trial, big no-no. And she, she said, well, I thought maybe I could settle the case, or I, you know, I don't know. So she went, and uh, he, Charles Hardy sort of uh, put on a very good old boy kind of uh, mean and, and said, you know, Teresa, what can we do to work this out? Well, she asked for $25,000, and he became enraged. And told her, in, in her words, he was going to wear me out in court and that he was going to make her a persona non grata all over Nashville in the business world. And she told me, she's a very soft-spoken woman, that she just lost it. Something in her snapped. And she leaned forward, and this is exactly how she said she did it. She leaned forward in the bar and she said, now you listen to me. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I don't care how much it costs and how long it takes. I am going to do everything to win. I'm talking Sandra fucking Day O'Connor. <laughs> She laughed as she told the story because she said, I know he did not know who that was. <laughs> and, and of course, after she told me that story, I realized an instant later, Sandra Day O'Connor wrote the opinion in her case when she won. And just the chills I got realizing that story made me convinced I had to get them out there. And these women should be as famous as Anita Hill. And so, um, uh, of course, Ten years later, uh, ten years when I was working as a judge, when I was on the bench, uh, one of the things that we saw was that sexual harassment cases across the country died in court. You must have experienced this as a lawyer. Notwithstanding this genesis and notwithstanding these cases, the fact of the matter is judges were having trouble in my era not me, uh, identifying sexual harassment. Uh, it really, if you do a Westlaw search of the word bitch, you will literally come up with numbers of cases in which that, the use of that word in the workplace is excused as a stray remark. Yeah. And male judges, largely white male judges, are essentially disparaging this history. How does that fit into your narrative, if at all? Or does it just simply depress you and we should talk about something yeah, else? Um, it does depress me, but I think it's also worth, worth talking about. I mean, in writing this book, this book was intended to be a celebration of just how much worse things used to be. I mean, sexual harassment didn't even have a name in 1964 when Title VII was enacted, let alone have any of the social you know, disapprobation that it has now. It was a madman world, literally. Um, so this book is a beginning of the story and how we got a vocabulary and a, and a legal, legal architecture to bring these claims, but it's hardly an ending. Um, and I think the thing that's especially frustrating with, with sexual harassment is that the, the decisions that have come down have been increasingly in recent years, um, uh, some, some bef while you were still on the bench, have been much more about focusing on the behavior of the claimant, the, the victim, how hard she protested, how loudly she protested, and then the, rather than the harassment itself and how a reasonable person would, would experience it, or on the employer's, the adequacy of the employer's preventive and remedial efforts. And you know, there was, as many of you in the room probably know, there were twin decisions in 1998 called the Farragher-Ellerth decisions where women had been, um, two plaintiffs different, in different claims, 
cases had been harassed by supervisors and they hadn't complained and the, the harassment had not ended in a tangible employment action. In other words, it was a hostile environment created by a superior, but no one had lost their job for um, re resisting. Um, and the court said, okay, we're going to give the employer an out in those kinds of situations. If the, supervisor, if the harassing supervisor fires someone, that's one thing. That's automatic liability. But if it's just a, ba a hostile environment where someone is talking about your legs all the time and asking about your breasts all the time and telling you what a great figure you have and maybe you should spend more time together all the time, all these are facts that were um, in the cases. One of the women had the dis misfortune of being a lifeguard, uh, so in a bathing suit all day with her harasser. Um, they said an employer will have an out if an affirmative defense if they have established a reme effective remedial program um, and the complainant unreasonably failed to use it. And so we moved in those, so unquestionably that did encourage some well-meaning employers to put in place important preventive measures and establish important. As an antidote to a lawsuit. Correct. Either for in good faith or as an antidote or to a lawsuit. Just for cost-benefit cost analysis. Correct, of course. But what a lot of them did, and I'm sure some of you who have worked before have experienced it, um, did something that one women's group called, called file cabinet compliance. They send everyone to a training. They fill out a form saying, I've attended. And then the employer says, we've, we've done our bit. And, and then when a, woman doesn't, when a woman fails to use that policy um, because she doesn't believe in it, or she goes to one supervisor but not the correct supervisor under the policy, then the employer can push her off. And most recently, I would just add, which um, I, I don't know how, how it would fare um, or how you would deal with it if you were still on the bench, Judge Gertner, but the, the Vance decision from the Supreme Court in 2013 um, made it even harder for women to overcome this um, affirmative defense because the court said that the only type of personnel who will qualify as a supervisor for purposes of triggering automatic liability, potentially, is someone only with the power to hire and fire you. And, you know, anyone who's been in the workforce today, especially in a larger workforce like, say, a Walmart where there are many levels of, or a factory where there are many levels of shift supervisors and so forth, um, knows that there are plenty of people in your workplace who can make your life a misery short of firing you. Um, with scheduling and, and all sorts of other ways that your life can be made very difficult. But here, here's another reason why the book is important. You, you should write this down. Um, <laughs> here's another reason. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that I found on, on the bench was that um, uh, this is all judicial, this is all decisional law for yes. law students. This is all stuff that judges have done interpreting, what is it, six words in the Civil Rights Act. Right. And so... To some degree, the, th th this rests in our hands. This is not Congress having specified X or Y. This is in our hands. And it is so important to go back to first premises, these cases, to ask the question, why did we do what we did? Why did we draw these lines? And so then when new lines are proposed, uh, like the Vance case, uh, like stray remarks, you can go back and say, you know, this does not fit in the context of these seminal cases. Um, and it's so important to go back to first premises. I remember that as a judge, somebody once made an argument in the Equal Pay Act. They said, judge, the market demands that men get paid, that this man get paid more. And I scratched my head and I said, you know, this is very interesting. It's, the, it's a good thing to be old. Because <laughs> as far as I can recall, the reason for Title VII was because the market failed. The government had to intervene because the market failed. You cannot use that as an excuse, as a justification. The lawyer was astonished <laughs> at, the, at the idea, but that's the reason to go back to first premises here. Why, why did we do what we do? Right. So talk about the pregnancy cases, because that's still the sticking point. Oh, that's, the, that's still where the law doesn't quite know what to do. Right. Right. The, the idea, pregnancy and motherhood really, in my opinion, and as a practicing lawyer still seeing cases come in, is, is really the greatest barrier to women's economic equality, whether they're in the C-suite or flipping burgers at McDonald's, that it is the, the most precarious moment in time for a woman's um, career and can, for women who are lower wage workers, be really the difference between 
um, keeping afloat and and destitution. Truly, it's not an overstatement. Um, and so, um, you know, the the notion of how do you deal? How what does equality look like when you're talking about real? undeniable physical difference. Um, and in the early years of, uh, <clears throat> of the um, decisions that make up this book, and, and just a quick footnote, I, a, another animating purpose of the book was that when, this, when, when sex was added to Title VII, that's all it was. Discrimination because of sex shall be illegal. It was added at the last minute. There were no congressional hearings. There was some history of how it came to be added, but there were no hearings, nothing on record. And so it was up to um, the EEOC, which at first was extremely uninterested in enforcing the law, and then up to the courts and the women who brought these cases, but the decisional law to give, to put meat on the bones and give shape to, to what it meant. Mm -hmm. And pregnancy certainly wasn't mentioned um, and uh, in, in any of the congressional discussions. Uh, the floor debate. And so um, early on, cases were devoted to the very obvious um, barriers, firing a woman when she was pregnant. Okay, the EEOC could get on board that that was um, illegal. Uh, um, removing, wiping the slate clean of her seniority when she went out on leave. Um, that was a Supreme Court case that said, no, that is obviously a, a, dis a distinct disadvantage because of sex. Um, there was a constitutional case, equal protection case, or due process, sorry, due process case, um, Cleveland versus LaFleur, that uh, struck down a policy that a, that a woman teacher had to go out on maternity leave in her fourth month um, because, God forbid, there be a suggestion that your teacher has ever, you know, had sex. Yeah, that's right. the word I was looking yeah, for. No, yeah, not to put too fine a point. Sex. <laughs> um, uh, so um, some th th these um, very overt barriers fell. But then we look, and then there was a, a very um, a decision that finally said, actually, sex pregnancy discrimination is not sex discrimination. That was the um, infamous General Electric versus Gilbert case, which involved a, um, uh, a disability, a paid uh, disability program at General Electric, and um, people who went out for other kinds of temporary disabil disabling conditions got uh, wage replacement and pregnancy was carved out. And the court said, well, because there are women who don't get pregnant too, this isn't a gender thing. This is just a pregnancy thing. So they made a distinction between pregnant and non-pregnant non persons. Non-pregnant persons, right. That was Correct. Non-pregnant bots, uh, I guess. <laughs> and, so, and so because women also comprised the non-pregnant persons group, then it couldn't be sex discrimination. P.S. I mean, it, dri it drives me bananas, and it never was mentioned in, in Gilbert. Just a few years, five years earlier, was the decision in Martin v. Phillips v. Martin Marietta, which is in the first case in the book, where the court had struck down a rule that barred the hiring of mothers with small children, um, but not fathers with small children. And the employer had defended itself by saying, but we hire mostly women. And most of our employees have children. They just, we just don't hire women with children that young. So because we hire these other women, it can't be sex discrimination. But they, then, I mean, the, the vicissitudes of the court, then five years later, in Gilbert, they said, no, this makes it not sex discrimination. So anyway, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act was enacted. And then uh, in 1978, and then the cases that are in the book approach all of the different um, permutations of, of how pregnancy um, should be approached by an employer. So we have Johnson Control, UAW versus Johnson Control, speaking of unions. We have uh, UAW um, challenging Johnson Control's battery manufacturer's rule that um, women who, who cannot prove they are infertile, not just women saying, I don't plan on having kids, but women who can't prove medically that they are infertile are barred from working with lead because it's a teratogenic substance and could hurt a potentially um, developing fetus. Now, it also was just as dangerous, if not more so, to men's, um, do you want to say the word, sperm? Yeah. <laughs> sperm. And, um, but men were allowed to continue working in these jobs. Um, and so, you know, women got themselves sterilized so that they could keep earning the paycheck. That's how desperate they were. Um, the company wouldn't even, uh, there was a, a married couple working for the company and the woman came forward and said, my husband has had, had a vasectomy, will that do? No, no, we're worried about you and you getting pregnant. Who knows what you're doing outside of the confines of marriage? So the court said, no, no matter how benevolent you state your motivation is. Pregnancy and the decision to take on risk to that pregnancy is the woman's and her family's alone. Deciding whether she's going to be an economic being or a mother first 
is her decision, which, w I mean, to uh, inject somewhat of a bright note in this depressing conversation, is the reason why we have women who are able to be in jobs on assembly lines, you know, um, as cops, as firefighters, taking on these dangerous roles. Not that I don't have people calling me all the time saying I inform them I'm pregnant and they put me on desk duty. Um, or alternatively, the other problem that's the last case in the book, sometimes pregnancy does start to interfere with your job. And if you're in one of these dangerous jobs or if you're in a job where you, for example, stand on your feet 10 hours a day, um, as um, many of my clients do. And um, then you ask, could I have some accommodation for a few months so I can have a f healthy pregnancy? Then there is a rejection of interest in protection. Right. But now, to, to, how did you, I mean, so these are cases you've dealt with all the time. What, what's the sort of the first case that grabbed you to want to write about the people in these cases? Well, I mean, aside from the story that I just mentioned with, with Teresa Harris, who was just um, such a, uh, that was a really intense experience to get to meet her. Um, I think one of the first interviews I did was um, of Kim Rawlinson in the Dothard v. Rawlinson case, which was decided in 1977 and had to do with, um, Kim Rawlinson was um, an, a, just out of college, University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, and wanted to be a prison guard. And she came from a family that was, her father owned a real estate business, you know, no history at all working in corrections. But she had taken some classes in college um, and, um, and especially had fallen in love with the field of uh, correctional psychology, the study of how inmates and guards all um, react to one another, um, how they react to the experience of incarceration. And she really wanted um, to work in that environment. As she said when she spoke with me, it just ticked a box inside of me. It just went bing. And to have someone who was a, you know, five foot two, uh, 115 pound woman, five foot three, 115 pound woman who had never had any experience in prisons but felt very deeply about social change and social justice and had grown up in a family with two sisters and parents who regularly used the N word. Um, you know, growing up in Montgomery, you know, through the bus boycott, through the years after that, and, and, and feeling, as she said, who dropped me off in this family? You know, this misfit uh. who, who was so bookish and stayed inside so much that neighbors would sometimes express surprise that, she, that there were three children in the house. They mm -hmm. thought there were just the two. So she felt like this misfit and this person who wasn't understood, and then she had this career goal that was even now a very unusual goal for women to have. They're still underrepresented. But in the 1970s, Alabama, to want that. And she, just the resilience of, of her story and the, and the tenacity of feeling like, I don't care. Her parents were furious at her for bringing this lawsuit, that it brought shame on her as a Southern woman and shame on the family, and it was going to hurt his business. And she persisted and persisted, and ultimately um, won. The reason she was, the, that she was not able to become a prison guard was because there was a height and weight requirement um, that uh, it turned out bore no relation to any sort of validated studies of what made a good prison guard. It was just Alabama had decided that bigger was better. By the way, not that big. The threshold was 5'2 and 120 pounds. Uh, <laughs> So right. she was 115. I asked her why she just didn't eat a lot of ice cream <laughs> right. to make it 120. But, but, but I mean, the, so the other subtext of this is people who are trying to figure out what they want to do for their with their yeah. lives as lawyers. Um, just the joy of uh, aligning yourself with someone who's do this courageous. I mean, that's part of the fun of what yes. of what you know I did before I was on the bench and what yeah. you do. Now, I mean, that, isn't that part of what the ama meeting amazing people who are prepared to take risks that you did not were at all prepared to take? No, that's right. And then in, in most of the cases in the book, with, with a couple notable exceptions, had almost nothing to show for it at the end. Interesting. Um, and so, and after years, I mean, there were a couple of cases that went fairly quickly, um, Kim Rawlinson's case being, being one of them, in part because they didn't, um, for various reasons, have an appeals court level. It was just district court and Supreme Court. But for most of these women in the book, it was years and years, eight years, nine years, even longer for Michelle Vinson, who brought the first sexual harassment case. 
And then they um, settled for paltry amounts. So for instance, um, Ida Phillips, who I'm going to read a brief excerpt of the book from her chapter, but you know, um, uh, litigated for years to try to get an assembly line job at Phillips, uh, at Martin Marietta um, Corporation, um, won. And then it turned out that they had had a layoff shortly after she would have been hired. And so her back pay was, was minimal. She got $15,000. So she bought herself her first air conditioner that she'd ever had in Florida and took her daughter to Disney World. Um, others, uh, like Michelle Vinson, the sexual harassment um, um, plaintiff, uh, you know, fought for 10 years, finally got an undisclosed settlement and went to nursing school and never practiced in a bank, worked in a bank again, which she had fallen in love with through the, through the job that ended up being the place she was harassed. So, yeah, I think... Um, as I, as I said at the beginning, the, the tenacity of my own clients and their, their own interest in just doing what's right, and they really don't have all that much um, sense of what lies ahead of them when they say, I want to I pursue this. Um, but they do it anyway. And, I mean, and what fun it is to represent them yes. under those circumstances. Yes. It, they're really just, I mean, every one of my clients could be a chapter in this book, truly. Um, just before you read the, the, from the chapter, uh, getting back to the initial question of why do these stories matter? Yes. Um, these are stories that are only 30, 40 years old. That's not enough for major attitudinal change in a generation. And to some degree, the, the judges that you will appear before are judges who were around and had their formative years at the time that these kinds of cases were being litigated. So you're, this, the generational change has not yet hit the bench, it's yep. happening, but yep. so it matters because these attitudes are pervasive um, and, and because that's the, that's the people that you'll be appearing in front of. Um, yeah. So why don't you read the chapter? Sure. Philip's chapter, that'd be good. Yeah, I'll just read the beginning of the, um, it's the first chapter in the book, the Phillips v. Martin Marietta chapter, and I just want to give you a sense of, my, my goal in the book was to make it extremely, to focus on stories, which is really what the law is. I mean, even corporate cases, it's stories, um, not just these, uh, you know, individual civil rights cases. And um, so just give you a sense of, of the kind of narrative. On a hot Florida night in September 1966, Ida Phillips sat down at her kitchen table to write a letter. Her small frame bowed over a tablecloth printed with orange and green flowers. She quickly filled three small pages with her tidy cursive. To the President of the United States, she wrote, as of this date, September 6, 1966, at 7 p.m., I answered an employment ad of Martin Company of Orlando, Florida, in which the company seeks 100 assembly trainees. However, after completing my application, I was told by the receptionist that my application could not be honored due to the fact that I have a preschool child. A neighbor had alerted Phillips to the newspaper notice placed by the Martin Marietta Corporation, a missile manufacturer with a sprawling facility 10 miles from downtown Orlando. With a workforce numbering in the thousands, it was one of the largest employers in the city. Entry-level jobs on the assembly line paid up to $125 a week, more than double what Phillips was earning as a waitress at the Donut Dinette. Even better, the job came with a pension plan and benefits, including insurance. You better get down there early, the neighbor advised. There's going to be a lot of people down there looking for that job. Phillips resolved to be one of them. 32 years old and the mother of seven children, ranging in age from 3 to 16, she was barely scraping by. Every day she counted up the tips that she'd made during her shift and decided what she could afford to buy for that night's supper. The little bit she had left over got tucked away to cover the bills. She certainly couldn't count on the wages that her husband, Tom, her husband, Tom Phillips, got from working as a mechanic. Those he usually drank. So Phillips, a vivacious, dimpled redhead, had driven the 10 miles to the Martin Marietta facility on Kirkman Road to submit an application. When she got to the front of the line, the receptionist asked her if she had any preschool-aged children. Hearing that Phillips had a three-year-old, the woman declined to let her apply. I felt like the world had caved in on me, Phillips recalled. I had my hopes up so much for it. She needed those wages, and her kids needed those benefits. 
That's when Phillips decided to write President Lyndon Johnson. My president, may I say that I believe that this is unjust from the policies that you have administered during your term in office, she implored, as equal opportunities, as equal employment, and constitutional rights. Phillips hadn't grown up paying much attention to politics, but she had recently registered to vote and, in her words, started reading the papers cover to cover. She may not have known specifically about the 1964 Civil Rights Act, but she plainly suspected that Martin Marietta was doing something unlawful. Philip's daughter, Vera Tharp, remembered that when their neighbor stopped by that night to check how Phillips had made out, he was incredulous. After all, he had kids in preschool, and the company had never objected. Less than a week after she'd put her letter in the mail, Phillips got a response from the White House. Her complaint, she was told, had been forwarded to the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the federal agency tasked with enforcing Title VII, for investigation. The following summer, in 1967, the EEOC issued a decision in Phillips' favor. In November, having tried unsuccessfully to convince the company to just settle the case by giving Phillips the job she'd applied for, the EEOC mailed a notice to Phillips, who by then had moved with her family to Jacksonville. The agency had done all it could, it said, but she had the right to continue the case on her own by filing a lawsuit in federal court. Phillips definitely wanted to press on. She was too angry not to. Now, she needed to find a lawyer. That's wonderful. And she did find a lawyer uh, very... Um, Fortuitously, um, Ida Phillips was white, and this was 1967 um, Jacksonville, high, extremely segregated, uh, the height of Jim Crow. And um, she went to a white lawyer she'd been referred to, and as she later said, he didn't, th he didn't want to fool with it. Um, and so she started thinking, who could I go to next? And she figured, you know, I'll bet a black lawyer would know how to handle a civil rights case. So there was a, an African-American lawyer in town running for judge. Um, she went to him. He said, I'm too tied up with the campaign to help you, but I've got this young associate, Reese Marshall, who just spent a year at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York City, and I bet he can help. So to give you a sense of how uh, uh, unknown the sex provision was when it was enacted. It, the, it, there was the confusion that it created about what it was actually supposed to do. Um, I, I met with Reese Marshall, who's still practicing in Jacksonville, and uh, he, he met with, with Phillips and really liked her a lot, but when she left the office, he had to go and take the statute book down from the wall and confirm, and he, he said to his surprise, yeah, sex is in there. <laughs> I guess it is illegal. So, um, you know, at that time there was no, um, there was no National Women's Law Center. Now had only just been formed and it was scattered all over the country. The members were scattered. Um, there was no uh, ACLU Women's Rights Project, though there was, was an ACLU. And so they were really on their own. And it was only finally when the case was granted cert to the Supreme Court that he was able to enlist the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to take the case um, before the court, you know, a more experienced litigator, uh, Bill Robinson, um, who was the head of their Title VII practice, um, took the case. And he, uh, one reason that Reese Marshall was able to convince LDF that um, even though Ida Phillips was a white woman, um, the issue of working mothers of small children was very much an issue that concerned African American women. They were the bulk of the mothers who were in the workforce. And the other reason that they took the case um, is because, uh, as articulated by one of the judges on the Fifth Circuit in, in um, his dissent from, from the um, opinion upholding the, the um, dismissal of the case, um, Judge Brown on the Fifth Circuit said, if, if this, this is a doctrine of sex plus that we're seeing at work here. So it's not all women who are kept out, it's just sex women plus a certain characteristic here, small children. But he said that reasoning is virtually endless and will make a mockery of Title VII because you could then bar um, you know, Jews who are left-handed or African Americans who don't have a driver's license. Just add a little plus factor on the protected trait and soon enough you've made you know, Swiss cheese of, of the protections in the law. And as he said, if sex plus stands, the act is dead. And so the LDF, um, in this sort of you know unlikely alliance um, with this um, white mother, 
from Southern, from Florida, um, got the court to uh, agree um, that a, a, a character, or excuse me, a policy that divided specifically between mothers and fathers was plainly the kind of sex-based distinction that Title VII was meant to address. Isn't that the famously um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, tactic when she was the, at the head of the ACLU Women's Rights Project, which is she would bring cases raising uh, differential treatment, but bring them on behalf of men who uh, were treated differently than women. And it was not because she was, uh, you know, because she was wanted to particularly favor men, but she thought she wanted to address gender roles. That's right. And she thought that what was in most interesting for the court was deal with situations where, for example, a man would not get the benefits, the, a, a widower wouldn't get the benefits that a widow a widower wouldn't get the benefits that a widow would, for example, and that that was dramatize the gender role issue much more, and that's sort of what yeah. these are as well. No, that's right. That that um, uh, that for every stereotype about a woman um, that she's supposed to be a wife and mother, there's a stereotype that the man is supposed to be the primary provider and working outside the home. Right. And so she she chose to come at the former problem through the latter group, and and. It, it was her hope, and sadly, I, I don't think that this has been achieved, to help break down stereotypes for men, too, which, um, you know, it, the, the more that, that men are not um, cabined in what masculinity uh, means or what manhood means, uh, the better it is for women because it because then and caregiving... And the are open that's right. to both sides. That's right. Right. That's right. And similarly, you know, the idea that it's not just, um, you know, African Americans who have a race. It's, you know, white women too. Right. And right. Um, right. so, you know, we're all sort of in this together in, in keeping these protections uh, vital. Do you see, the, my last question, and then I'll open up to questions to everyone. Do you see any um, parallels in these cases with uh, uh, the transgender issues, LGBT issues now? Because the, the, um, the forgotten story is that uh, uh, homosexual rights, gay, LGBT rights are really where, in terms of employment discrimination, are where women's rights were in the 60s. Uh, gay marriage was one issue, but there's still no protection for, in most, play, in, certainly under the federal law, except in a decision I wrote, but whatever. <laughs> um, there's no protection in the federal law. There's some protection in states uh, with respect to LGBT rights, but do you see some parallels there? No, absolutely, and I, I, in answering the question, I want to harken back to something you said a few minutes ago about why these stories are important and why we remember them. Really, in, in some way, shape, or form, every single, especially the earliest ones, but really all of these cases are about stereotypes, about what a woman is, what she's capable of, what she wants to do, what her preferences are, um, what she chooses in her life in terms of childbearing and child rearing. Um, and uh, and one of the, the cases that is sort of known for creating the modern law of sex stereotypes as sex discrimination is the Price Waterhouse case, uh, which involved a, a woman attempting to become and being denied for partnership at big eight accounting firm Price Waterhouse, Ann Hopkins, um, who was told she, she was one of 88 candidates. She had the biggest book of business by far. She was the only woman out of the 88. And um, she was turned down, not because of her relationships with clients and not because of her book of business and the money she'd brought in, but because the partners who assessed her deemed her macho, said she needed a course at charm school, said she overcompensated for being a woman, that she swore too much for being a lady partner. And even her, I think this is a really interesting fact, that one of the most damning quotes from the case came from her chief supporter at Price Waterhouse, her mentor, when she went to him and said, how, this is who I am. How do I, how do I make partner next time around? And he said, well, thinking he was helping, why don't you try walking more femininely, talking more femininely, wearing uh, makeup, styling your hair, and wearing jewelry? And, you know, no big deal. <laughs> change who you are as a woman, be a different kind of woman. And that what was extraordinary was that the Supreme Court, in, including relying in, in part on some social science, it was the first time social science research had been used, social psychology had been used in a, in a Title VII case, said, no, denying someone uh, a, a, a promotion because she's the wrong kind of woman is just as much sex discrimination as denying her the job because she's a woman, full stop. And that was that was revolutionary. 
And, um, but I, I like to note that even though that's the most famous, at least to law nerds, it's famous, um, which was in 1989, very recently, you go back to the very first case in the book, the earliest cases decided under Title VII, uh, not to mention the Equal Protection Clause, and it, they're talking about these laws were meant to eliminate stereotypes, meant to eliminate consideration of people as members of groups and not individuals. And so in reliance on the, um, the holding in um, Price Waterhouse and the, and the um, articulation of this sex stereotype doctrine as sex discrimination, um, trans workers initially were the folks who have had a lot of success in winning, um, winning acknowledgment that um, gender identity discrimination is sex discrimination based on all of the case law that's here and uh, otherwise decided under Title VII. Um, that the, the meaning of what sex is uh, grew a long time ago to encompass gender, um, a you know, broader concept of what it means to be male or female, man or woman. Um, and ironically, because so much of the, the news we hear about how transgender folks are being demonized and dehumanized in our culture when it comes to things like bathroom laws and public accommodation laws, they actually have fared fairly successfully um, in under Title VII because the idea that, like, like Anne Hopkins, didn't conform to the sufficiently feminine ideal of being a woman, the idea that um, a man, born, someone born biologically male, chooses to now, I, and, and does, not just chooses, is, is feels, identifies as um, a woman. Th th that's on a continuum that the courts seem to be able to process. Um, and there's at least one appeals court has found that. And the EEOC also takes that position. Sexual orientation has been harder for the, in my view, completely illogical um, and irrational reason that um, the trans uh, issue is one of appearance, whereas sexual orientation is one of wow. behavior. Wow. And that has, which is, I, of course, to me, a distinction without a difference, um, but that they're all inextricably linked. But anyway, that's one reason the LGB, main reason that LGB employees have had a harder time gaining traction. The EEOC, to its credit, I know I bashed them at the beginning, but I give them a lot of credit that they've been out, fr on f out front on this issue and, in fact, this year um, right. filed their first cases um, on behalf of uh, one on behalf of a lesbian and one on behalf of a gay man. That's very interesting. The case that I had uh, was a case of a, a postal worker who, in fact, was not out as a homosexual, mm -hmm. but the rest of his colleagues, his co-workers, thought he was gay. And so they were putting things on his locker, uh, uh, trying to suggest, you know, not mocking his being gay. And the lawyers again came, again, this is, these are lawyers who did not read the early cases. So the lawyers came and they argued, well, he's not, he hasn't said, told anyone that he's gay, the, the, the plaintiff's lawyer said, and the defendant's lawyer said, but it's clear. And I said, it's not about whether, what he is or he isn't. It's about stereotyping. It's about the, his coworkers believing that he's not a real man. It's about who they think he that's is. That's right. That's right. It's, it's, and it's whether, you know, and, that's, and all of these cases, women who have children working, well, you're not my model, you're not my stereotype of a real woman. The sexual harassment cases are obviously in the same category. So it really was, I believe, the core um, of, of discrimination, um, and I've ruled in his favor. Nobody appealed, but oh, the good. Supreme Court hasn't gotten to the uh, the, the transgender cases yet. And but you they, heard it here first. I think they. I think that's the next big Title VII issue to go to them. That may well be the next to go to them. The question is what they will well, do. Oh, yeah. Why don't we open it up to questions? Anyone have any questions? Yes, back in the back. Yeah. Oh, there's a mic. Thank you so much. I'm curious what you think the court might do, if anything, with some of the social sciences you referenced earlier around implicit bias. Right? So a lot of these cases um, and the case law itself deals with explicit bias, intention, looking at that. Um, so there are some sticky issues when you start thinking about implicit bias, reading the mind, et cetera. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts about uh, how that might be managed in a legal context. And of course, how we heard at the debate the other night that people of the same race can't ever be biased against one another, too. That's um, right, right, right. Um, uh, well, 
and and I'm, I am interested in hearing your thoughts about this, um, Judge. I don't have any thoughts on this. <laughs> no, go on. <laughs> I, sadly, um, I think implicit bias is, is, well, I mean, again, we, who knows what this court's composition is going to be, but in the Walmart case of a few years back, we got a pretty implicit bias um, as, a, as, a, um, as a salient factor in an analysis of discrimination got a big blow, um, where the, um, uh, Dr. Bealby, Bill Bealby's um, um, analysis of how implicit, stere implicit bias and stereotypes were infecting the promotional and pay practices at Walmart were um, disregarded as essentially you know, airy-fairy hogwash. Um, and I, courts have increasingly been doing that. I worked on a case when I was at the EEOC against um, Mike Bloomberg's company um, that involved caregiver discrimination. We haven't even talked about that, but that's a sort of extension of the motherhood um, and uh, that's kind of the successor to the, the Phillips v. Martin Marietta type scenario. Um, but we had an expert um, in that case, uh, Jean Borgita, uh, very esteemed um, in the field, and uh, that it was kept out um, because the, the judge in her wisdom said we don't need um, anyone to tell us, uh, we don't need an expert to tell us that there are stereotypes in the world about men and women, which might well be true that we're sort of aware of them, to, but to actually explain to a jury how they affect and infect employment decisions is a very different thing than just sort of knowing that in the air. So I know that um, uh, there's, uh, there's some new areas of um, academic study around this, and, um, and I think there's been at least one court that has agreed that we need to be maybe moving more to a model of, in terms of proof and causation, that is l less focused on intent, because intent oh, yeah. right. is, has become so, diff I mean, it's so difficult to prove always, but then especially as people have become more aware of these issues and bias has become more subconscious or implicit, that um, that we should be focusing on causation. Was it because of race that this person didn't get the, get the job? Was it because of gender that this woman didn't get the promotion? And less focusing on individual wrongdoers' brains and intentions. Um, and so. it's talking about, and, and is, it, is it because of gender could then uh, bring up all the ways in which gender plays subconsciously. I am very pessimistic in the same way that Jillian is about um, implicit bias because I, the cases that I have written about since I left the bench were cases in which judges were ignoring explicit bias, yeah, right. trivializing explicit bias. That's so right. they're not even close. And it's true that the case law has uh, I think for all sorts of sociological reasons, sort of the sense of post-racial and post-gender world, the case law focuses on intentional, on the wrongdoer. It's as if, going back to my market comment, the market is humming along fabulously, women and minorities are doing great, but there are occasionally bad actors. And so the case law is looking for the bad actor and not the systemic issues that really are involved in implicit bias. So I, I think that that may be a change that actually someone should, it may be a legislative change, it may be something that will shake the courts into a very different direction. Um, because the notion of a wrongdoer uh, doesn't make any sense. Just to give you a classic example of that, um, this concept of how you look, right? The, I'm not, saying anything about the presidential campaign, but when you talk about someone doesn't look like president, pause for a moment. Every case I had as a, as a employment lawyer involved the defendant saying, well, gee, I don't think so-and-so looked like the named Henry R. Luce chair in you know, sociology. I don't think she looked like a supervisor. There is nothing more stereotypical than that. You know, that her looks don't map onto the way people in this job, the incumbents in this job looked. Well, small wonder. Um, so we're dealing with attitudes like that that, that, uh, that, we're, that we're struggling with and not the bad actor who says, you know, I'm not hiring you because you're a woman. Summit, you had your hand up. Yes, just to raise three quick points. Um, when I started teaching in high school in 69, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, sure. Uh, when I started teaching in high school in 1969, one of my senior colleagues 
had been born in 1910 and had worked for decades as a public school teacher in New York State and in Massachusetts. In the late 30s or early 40s, she did not marry the man she wanted to marry because if she had, she would lose her job in a public school because the uh, rationale that was given was uh, married women don't need to work and, and uh, there were many men who were unemployed. We've come quite a ways from that. Second, I graduated from high school in 64 when the Civil Rights Bill passed. And if I'm remembering right, one of the stories was that the prohibition on discrimination because of sex was actually inserted into the bill in, in an book. attempt to sabotage to right. the bill. So it, it's, among other things, a warning that we have to be careful when we look for congressional intent. It can be muddy, and different people in Congress may be trying to do very different things. Right. The third thing is, I, I would suggest that on occasion, uh, discrimination on account of gender may have a rational basis. When I was a college student in Ohio, state law provided that young women could legally drink alcoholic okay. beverages at the age of 18, and young men could not until they were 21. I've never been drunk in my life, but I thought that was a rational law. And I strongly suspect that the insurance companies could have provided a lot of evidence indicating that you could trust young women more than young men to handle alcohol. And I suspect that's now gone very much by the wayside. That's right. Wasn't that challenged and overturned? Craig V. Boren. Right, yeah. right. I'll add just one more practical consideration where the market has moved in uh, such a direction as to benefit not just women, but men also who are interested in becoming parents. Our first son was born in 1975. Our second son was born in 1980. And I can tell you the drop in the birth rate uh, changed conditions in maternity hospitals in many places, including Boston. And the odds of a woman being able to give birth under conditions that she found uh, better than what had prevailed, mm -hmm. including allowing the father into the delivery room, sure. Makes uh, yeah. went up very substantially. There's actually a wonderful account in Jillian's book about the, the legislative debate surrounding Title VII um, and the extent to which adding gender to it was mocked. Yeah. 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 It, it, it has, I would actually give an addendum to your comment about um, the, why it was added. There's been a lot of debate about why it was added um, at the very last minute by Howard Smith, a virulent segregationist from Virginia who opposed the 64 Civil Rights Act. And actually, very incongruously, he had a long history as a supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and uh, yeah, and in fact, one of the, there was a critical letter to the editor about it, in the New York Times about the review of my book from one of his nieces or, ne or daughters or granddaughters saying that he was very supportive of women in the family getting getting education and getting jobs and so forth. Um, so I think the, uh, the, um, the, the narrative that I think has emerged is probably the most uh, likely is that he um, saw that the writing was on the wall about um, that this law was going to pass, that he didn't want, um, and he got a lot of pressure from the National Women's Party, which was a mostly white um, group of activists, including Alice Paul, who wanted the Equal Rights Amendment enacted, got a lot of pressure from them that um, if black women were going to be getting benefits by virtue of their race, protection on the job by virtue of their race, then sex needed to be added so that white women were going wow. to be protected as well. Um, and uh, in any event, when he when he raised it, there was a lot of great ribaldry um, and joking in the, uh, you know, a lot of us here take my wife kind of humor um, that was, that met his amendment. But then also 11 of the 12 um, women who were in the House of Representatives, 12 women, 11 of them spoke in favor of, of the legislation and it was enacted. But your point is well taken that um, legislative intent in this 
this in this case is quite muddy, um, and in in this case the intent might have been simply a, a racist one. Um, uh, yeah, and then uh, just the last thing I wanted to mention when you talk about about fathers, I really believe just as a matter of policy, and we talked about this a little bit with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, legacy and breaking down stereotypes. I think as a matter of policy, you you look at these. There's some companies like Google and Amazon and these companies that are announcing with great fanfare that they're um, that they're going to have paid leave and it's going to be 16 weeks or 20 weeks or a year. Very few of them are offering it on equal terms to fathers, and um, beyond the six or eight weeks of actual recovery from childbirth that, that biological mothers need to get, my belief is that the way to comport not just with the law but to make it uh, not a stigmatizing event to take leave is to make it gender neutral. Um, but that's, that's something that happens by, by law, um, but it's a law that we need. 13%, 13% of private sector workers have a single day of paid maternity leave or paid leave of any kind, 13 percent. So I think that, I think it, it's one o'clock. I think we need to stop at this point. One, any last questions? Any? All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was terrific.